so that we make sure that the uh, bottom of the pyramid, the poorest of the poor, are also electrified. The UN and the world as such has only nine years left to reach its sustainable development goal of providing universal access to clean and affordable energy. Or in other words, in making sure that no child anywhere in the world has to rely on a petrol lamp while studying at night. However, that means that we still have to connect 1.2 billion humans to the grid. If we were to connect them to their respective national grids, that not only would be very cost ineffective and power ineffective, it also would be not feasible in just a little bit less than a decade left. So with my guest today, David Lecoq, I want to talk about the significance of off-grid for the world, its potential in various regions around the world, and how to recover from that quite significant sales bump during the pandemic, because sales actually went down 26% due to COVID. Now, quite positive that I'll get some exciting insights by David, because not only is he the CEO of the Alliance of for Rural Electrification, short ARE, which is an international business association which made it its main mission to make sure that everyone in the world, in particular all rural people in low- and medium-income countries, will have access to affordable, secure, clean energy by 2030. But on top of that, he also was elected as one of Belgium's 100 most inspiring and sustainable young professionals a couple of years ago. So glad to have you on our podcast, David. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Welcome to the Smartery Podcast, a podcast for and with the creators of the new energy world. A world in which energy will be renewable, decentralized and digital, bringing together electricity, heat and mobility. Let us show you how we will get there and who will get us there. David, the first thing you have to tell me is like, how did you manage to be nominated as one of the 100 most inspiring and sustainable young Belgians? <laughs> well, um, it's, uh, it's a while ago, um, but essentially I saw an uh, open call for applications for people in Belgium all across uh, the country that were involved in, let's say, uh, matters of sustainability and that were taking initiative, uh, taking a lead in, in this area. And so I applied and then by a jury of uh, peers, I uh, was elected to this uh, cohort uh, of which I'm still part today. Uh, through some uh, some uh, projects to help companies uh, with their sustainability. Actually, that's still what you're busy with today as CEO of ARE. And um, yeah, let's maybe just we cover the basics first. We always try to cover some basic knowledge and then later on dive into the expert questions. So um, talking about definitions, what exactly do you understand when talking about off-grid solar plants? Well, uh, thank you for that question. Indeed, it's um, important to, to define what we're talking about. An off-grid plant, quite simply, is a power system that works independently of uh, the central grid in any particular country. So it means that the point of the generation of the electricity is close to the point where it is used. Uh, such an off-grid power system can be based on any uh, electricity producing technology and can feature a backup system like storage for with batteries or not have a storage system. And they cater to the energy needs of um, the population that can be either just a household or a cluster of households all the way up to small cities uh, which are uh, currently uh, not enjoying the benefits of electricity. When interviewing some of my previous guests, specifically, for example, one of the other guests from Brazil, they were usually talking about microgrids when talking about decentralized energy systems. So is there a difference between a microgrid and an off-grid? Well, there is no, um, I would say, globally accepted definition on where exactly uh, one draw the, draws the line. Um, what we at least uh, see is that for us, standalone power systems um, allow individual Uh, consumers to have a continuous electricity supply, uh, whereas microgrids um, do that same, but for a group or a community of customers. Um, in any event, when uh, you're going to choose whether you're going to go for a standalone system, so uh, for one household or individual, or if you're going to go for a more of a community approach with a microgrid or a bigger uh, one, which is then called a mini grid, uh, that you do typically on the basis of a pre-feasibility study. All right, so now I more or less got a picture of what uh, we're talking about when talking about off-grid. Uh, what is the main 
deployment mode um, off-grid power sources? Is it uh, replacing, for example, the petrol lamp that I mentioned earlier? Is it more a larger scheme such as a desalination plants or water pumps? Do you have some numbers there? Well, off-grid applications are just applications that provide electricity for a certain use. And just like we have it uh, in Germany, in Belgium, everything can be powered with the electricity provided. Off-grid PV specifically is often used uh, both of, at the household level, uh, so for the typical things that the household uh, needs, such as lighting, as well as for what is called an, the productive use, which is to power income generating activities for those that are benefiting from the system. The beauty of off-grid is that as this is a grassroots or, or bottom-up approach, is that it is perfectly tailored to the current and forecasted energy needs of um, where you're going to use this electricity. And so you can power everything from two light bulbs up to a big desalination plant. Uh, that just depends on uh, one wants to install when uh, putting up the system. We actually have, um, maybe I can add, we actually have an interesting paper we launched uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, very recently, on the decentralized renewable energy innovations, precisely in the agri-sector uh, productivity area, uh, which is also then to address the global food system challenges. You can find it on our uh, website, and it has uh, case studies as well from uh, the field. Uh, so from some of our members like Sun Culture, GAM Power, Tesfault, uh, which are all providing state-of-the-art solutions to boost that agro productivity and um, importantly provide access to water. So I mentioned earlier that they have a big role to play in connecting still the 1.2 billion people who are currently do not have access to electricity. Greenpeace apparently estimates that 2 billion people will be supplied with electricity via off-grid systems in 2030, which is a big number. And hopefully that will cover a lot of these 1.2 billion people we still have to connect. But are these numbers realistic? Because usually when it comes to SDGs, I think we're all behind on all of the SDGs. Yes, but I mean, one uh, needs to be uh, positive. Eh? It's not a question or if uh, we're going to uh, have electricity everywhere in the world. It's just a question of when, at least for us, 2030 is really the end date. Uh, let's say hopefully we can achieve it even sooner um, because electricity, it's not just electricity as such is uh, nobody cares about that. It's what you can do with it. And without electricity, it is just impossible to live, uh, let's say, um, what we would define as, as, a, as a modern uh, lifestyle. It is impossible to run businesses or scale them up. I think even uh, cold chain storage, to give just one example, it's absolutely essential to empower people's lives and, and local economies. So we don't have an option, really. Um, it needs to be done. Now, yes, the numbers are ambitious, eh? of course. There will be many factors that influence whether or not we reach this target by 2030. First and foremost is, of course, is the money going to be there? Uh, because if you only have the money to uh, build a tent, uh, but you need to build a castle, then it's going to be complicated. So there's a question of money and then how that money is going to be used because we need uh, to attract uh, more private capital. So think of interesting ways to incentivize uh, private financiers to uh, step up their involvement in this sector and more generally encourage all sorts of uh, public and private partnerships where the government defines the contours and what is really important, which is things like um, safety, uh, affordability, environmental impact. And so really the, the, the rules of the game and that within that one lets the private sector do its job of being creative in finding ways to deliver on their goals. I think if we get that balance right between policy regulation on the one side and access to finance on the other side, there is no question. Uh, that we will uh, reach these targets. Encouragingly, in that context, is also that today, certainly the technology is there. So we know where the electricity is lacking. We have the means, uh, the technological means to do it. We do that uh, every day that passes in a more cost competitive way, even outpricing um, more traditional forms of electrification and certainly grid extension when we talk about rural areas. So it's only a question of getting it right and, and keeping a focus, a relentless focus on reaching this objective of access to clean energy, which in turn enables, well, itself is SDG 7, but that also enables pretty much every other 
SDG um, that you can otherwise simply not achieve if you do not have electricity. All right. So I love your positive attitude. And it's very great to hear that you really think it is feasible to get there even before 2030, maybe. So if we look at the world and the different regions, I guess different regions have different potential here for off-grid systems. Southeast Asia is a very interesting region. Maybe you can give us a tour around the world and highlight which regions have which kind of potential or demand even. In general, off-grid systems are relevant everywhere in the world uh, because of their versatility, because of the fact that they are tailored to the energy needs as well as what is available locally as a renewable energy source. If there is a good uh, water supply, uh, you can think of small hydro, if there is a lot of sun, um, if there is uh, a good uh, wind. So you can really tailor it to uh, the different geographies um, and that, uh, let's say, a scientific element applies throughout the entire world. Where the differences lie will um, be in things like policy, regulation, and access to finance. So where is going to uh, where it's going to be easier to electrify the populations. So um, you mentioned Southeast Asia. Well, Southeast Asia, of course, is a huge and also very interesting region uh, when it comes to electrification because it's uh, is very geographically diverse. Particularly in uh, Southeast Asia, the presence of thousands of islands, much like in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. makes it logistically and financially challenging, not to say impossible, for the national grid to go there with a huge infrastructure over the sea and so on to power uh, what will be typically be smaller communities or, or smaller energy needs. So here again, instead of taking the, the old outdated approach of building huge plants and then uh, pulling cables in every direction um, over land to remote areas or under the sea to islands. We would uh, argue that uh, decentralized uh, renewable energy systems, so off-grid systems, are much more suited because they inverse the logic and they look at what is the situation in terms of the resource available, what is the need today and tomorrow, and then just design the system accordingly. I would invite also our, our listeners today to look at another publication we developed on uh, the private sector business models for clean energy mini grids uh, that we have captured uh, from lessons learned in South and Southeast Asia. I really love the example of Asian countries with a lot of small islands, such as Indonesia. Now, is it a challenge? Because I imagine if, you, if you're just like one landlocked uh, country and you're developing a national grid, you know, you're investing in the infrastructure, it kind of makes sense for the regulators. But if you want to drive all these individual off-grid power stations on little islands, is it a challenge to really get the regulators on board? Because then probably parts of it, um, you really need the private sector on board to drive that development. It just seems much more tedious than saying, okay, you know, we build power lines all over the country, we run it, we own it. It's, it's just a question of um, which infrastructure, the question of ownership and control can be defined as per the country's priorities. I are actually, uh, together with uh, several partners, for most of which uh, UNIDO will shortly release a new special policy guide for decision makers, precisely depending on their national priorities, which policies they can adopt, so uh, which have been tried and tested to have a successful mini-grid uh, development in their country. So right now you see that when we talk about islands or remote areas, often either there is uh, no electricity or there are some diesel generator or something like this. Um, and very occasionally there is a national grid which um, provides power with a quite a frequent brownouts and, and, and blackouts. So it's no wonder that people want to have clean energy mini grids and uh, standalone solutions. And that includes in pretty much, uh, well, at least most of the countries in the world also these off-grid systems. Perhaps the last point that I wanted to add, uh, South and Southeast Asia, is that the market for the energy access solutions has been estimated by the company Bloomberg New Energy Finance at more than 339 million people, out of which clean energy mini grids are estimated uh, to make up 44% of all the new electricity connections. That is huge. And this is just mini grids. You add to that the standalone solutions. So it means that you arrive at figures like the International Energy Agency has also earlier calculated, which is that at the very least, the majority of all the new connections in the world will be uh, more economically feasible 
thanks to a decentralized renewable energy system. So that is for the new connections. And I would dare argue that quite a lot of the existing connections uh, with diesel generators, for example, will be replaced over time with renewable energy solutions simply because of a question of cost, because of a question of user friendliness. Also, there is no noise or sound pollution. So that really helps. We even see uh, that in some areas where people that have a grid connection that are not super happy about it uh, because of the rolling blackouts in, in a number of geographies, that they themselves, in addition, install their own private uh, standalone uh, system so that uh, they uh, ensure their own uh, power supply 24-7. So there is, first and foremost, the, the people that do not have electricity today. I think that is where the priority lies. And then also for climate change reasons and, and general affordability reasons that uh, we will phase out and essentially uh, displace uh, diesel-based systems. That's great to hear that user experience and cost effectiveness are two very big drivers here because I think they're usually uh, the most effective drivers, actually. So what do you think would be the most effective approach to push this development further? Is it to focus on individual industries, let's say mining on the one hand or on schools or hospitals? Or should we try to electrify each sectors equally? I think we need an approach that really encompasses the electrification of entire areas, not just of specific customers. So um, one model uh, that often is uh, used and uh, goes by the name of the anchor model, ABC. I mean, the point is that you start with the electrification of a more capital intensive company or actor in a certain area and use that as the anchor load. Um, to then from there on out electrify the surrounding population. That is one option. You can also do swarm electrification where you just start really at the household level and then interconnect the systems as the demand grows. And then for all these sectors of agriculture and uh, telecom and, and mining and so on, there it is uh, simply a question of the reliability of the system. Um, which is very straightforward, very good in the case of renewable energy systems. You also hedge yourself from price uh, risks and volatility. If you are powered, uh, I mean, imagine you are a big farm or a mine and you are powering yourself with uh, diesel, yeah, that, uh, you know, if the, or, or another fuel, if the price of the fuel shoots up, your OPEX shoots up dramatically as well. So at least with renewables, you know what you're getting. And then with governments, it's again a bit different. So we need to see at what is the use case, but we need to have one approach that is what in the sector is referred to as integrated electrification planning um, for really powering everybody in a given area so that we make sure that the bottom of the pyramid, the poorest of the poor are also electrified. It would be fundamentally unjust to uh, electrify just, uh, let's say, the, the, the more uh, middle class or wealthier uh, citizens and, and businesses in one area. And then uh, the other ones, simply because they can't afford it, wouldn't have it. At the end of the day, electricity is a public good. So we need to be able to uh, find approaches and we have them, as I mentioned, with the UNIDO paper that we are uh, collaborating on. Thanks, that really was a brilliant crash course in uh, terminology in regards to electrification strategy. So now understand what the anchor approach is, what swarm electrification is, and why in the integrated electrification planning is so important. What I would like to dive into now nearing the end of our podcast is that I already mentioned that um, sales in the off-grid sector dropped by 26% during COVID. Um, do you think that uh, the sector will be able to recover from that bump quickly enough to reach uh, the overarching goal of universal electrification by 2030? And uh, what would be the necessary steps to recover from this quite severe bump? Yeah, that is an excellent question. Uh, of course, COVID-19, uh, when it hit in uh, March 2020, it was a really big uh, shock, uh, so to say, for the entire world economy and obviously also for the off-grid sector. And it had really a significant impact because, well, international travel halts, uh, people can't move around anymore. So you have to imagine you have systems uh, that are in remote areas that, uh, well, sometimes they need maintenance or you want to build new systems, but you cannot even drive there. And so this has uh, really been quite complicated, particularly for the companies that are on uh, the ground. Um, so that would, uh, in my opinion, explain uh, why sales have dropped, uh, at that, uh, at, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. 
That is why uh, the Alliance for Rural Electrification uh, led a sector-wide uh, call to action uh, let's say, federating about 150 institutions and organizations uh, with a few core requested recommendations uh, that we made uh, to, to the international public sector, to philanthropies, to say, OK, look, uh, we need to recognize this sector as an essential service uh, uh, so that we can at least uh, maintain the infrastructure that is already there. We need to have technical assistance and we need to have financial support in a certain sense. So one support is on, on, on cash flow. Uh, and the other one is also simply to accelerate um, procedures on the rollout. Because when you see that even in pre-pandemic times, often where the, the, the difficult, one of the major obstacles to uh, electrification is that the, the processes for permitting are very, very long. They take a lot of time. At the end of the day, we as the private sector, we are ready to deliver on SDG 7 as quickly as uh, possible. The only thing that it needs is good cooperation between the public and private sector. An investment that really is worthwhile making, because as you mentioned before, it is the base for so many more things that come on top of it. Whether it is children actually being able to learn in the evening because they have a light, whether it is um, people being able to run their small or medium sized business simply because they now have electricity, whether it is powering the production of clean water, it is absolutely the base for so many more SDGs that we still have to reach. Well, it's been really brilliant to have you in the podcast, uh, David, because it's been so important to understand the significance of off-grid really for literally billions of people worldwide. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Zakis. It's been a really pleasure to be here. And of course, I'm available uh, for you and all the listeners today uh, for uh, any follow-ups uh, that you uh, may have or cooperations you would like to set up. Stay tuned for more episodes of the Smart EE podcast. Much more information on off-grid systems can be found at InterSolar Europe, the world's leading exhibition for the solar industry in Munich. Information on the exhibition and the parallel conference can be found online at intersolar.de.